Well, good, good morning, everybody. There's nothing like hearing a Mandarin go native. Uh, really interesting to hear Michael Jay, who was once the head of the Foreign Office, telling the people that once employed him to get their act together. Um, let's hope they're listening. Um, and I share his view that it's absolutely fantastic to see many, so many um, people here uh, from the BMA and beyond. Um, really terrific. 18 months ago, uh, I was taken by Johannes Garstor, the foreign minister of Norway, to Spitsbergen to look at the ice pack, or rather to look at the absence of the ice pack. For four winters now, uh, Norway has experienced uh, a complete failure of the ice pack to form, and the consequence has been that baby polar bears are unable to make the leaps from one ice flow to another and out eventually into adulthood and further procreation. Um, and of course, that's something which people, and we have a formidable force from the London Zoo here, uh, that's something which people identify with. They identify rather less with people, and uh, Michael Jay has rightly uh, emphasized the people element of this uh, catastrophe, um, particularly in Darfur and, and, and in East Africa and Somalia. And so people is what today is about. But of course, we can't talk about people without the context. And our panel today uh, in our first session is about context. Uh, the huge development that is going on in climate change and uh, how, we, how we tackle it. And as a media operator, I have to confess that the media has lost faith in climate change. Not that we disbelieve it, but we just don't cover it anymore. Uh, largely, I think, because of the controversy at East Anglia and beyond and the effects of the war fought by the opponents of the belief in climate change. And we're in a bad state. Mm. People like Michael Jay and the people he advises are not going to make much headway unless the mainstream, the, the, the opinion formers, the doctors, the teachers, the media, the politicians, really get behind an understanding of what's going on. So I'm absolutely delighted first to uh, introduce this morning our first speaker, um, who is uh, Alejandro. Uh, is that the correct? Alejandro, yes, yes, thank you very much indeed for being here. Um, he advises the Nelson Mandela Foundation, among other things. Uh, he is at the, he's in the engine room of the battle against man-made climate change. Thank you. Should I go yes, to the left. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Well, a pleasure to be here. Thanks, uh, Hugh, for the invitation. Um, let me um, run through a presentation knowing that uh, colleagues from Cetazel and others will focus more on what's going on with species. I want to focus more on um, what are some unexpected ways of thinking about ecological stress. Um, and the first thing to say is that we all know there's a very strong connection being proven be between uh, global climate change patterns and uh, organized political violence. And two, you know, some of you might be familiar with this study two months ago. Uh, establish a quantitative connection between over 200 conflicts between 1950 and 2004 uh, and, uh, and, um, and basically the global uh, climate change patterns, particularly the El Nino oscillation. Um, but m my sense is that we will be tempted more and more to see maps like these that focus on the equator as a very unstable region. Um, and, and two things are important. One is that Climate is uh, a driver of pressure, but the real pressure on conflict and, and security has to do with people getting hotter, with climate getting drier, with land being less productive, with there being less water and less water available to grow food. Uh, and so, uh, in essence, one of the core messages I want to leave with you today is that climate change and security is essential, but it's fundamentally essential because of resource scarcity and the availability and access to resources by people. Um, now, the, the second uh, thing that is important is that we shouldn't be misled by uh, looking at this very sort of dark red uh, band in the equator. And what I will argue in a minute is that actually the links between the equator and the rest of the planet are very strong and might play out in unexpected ways. So let's zoom into one particular example, you know, the Jordan uh, River Basin. And you can see in the map where the, the Jordan River cuts 
across a very, very sensitive area in terms of international security already. Um, now, in the blue, um, uh, the blue circle shows the, 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 the flow of water in the, in the River Jordan in the 1960s. The little violet one shows the flow of water in uh, 2010. And the little black one inside is the flow of water in the lean months of 2010. So you start to get a picture of just how much water uh, scarcity is being driven in the region. And this is not just a, uh, a consequence of climate change, it's really a consequence of resource governance. How much water is being extracted, by whom and for what purpose, with agriculture playing a very, very uh, strong role. And so very quickly we realized that it really climate change is a very big pressure, a very big driver, but really resource access, availability, and resource politics is, 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 is very much uh, what will determine probably the future stability of the, of the Middle East. And so we zoom out and we see that actually global stress is happening all around the world. You see uh, the areas in red is, is very high stress uh, and, and degraded beyond that. The circles show where climate change is likely to amplify these, these threats. And, and here you begin to see that actually it's not just about the equator, right? Uh, it's about very sensitive areas um, around the world. Um, so let us zoom out again, perhaps to outer space for a second. Um, uh, and and what I, can we switch this on? This is, a, this is a weather animation done by the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the US. Um, and what you see here is, is two very important things. One is that the equator and the rest of the world is completely interconnected. Yeah? And so the gray area shows the, the moisture in the planet. Uh, and the orange is where that moisture is actually turning into rain and falling, precipitation. Yeah? Um, and so you begin to see actually that the tropical rainforest, you see the Amazon right there, you see the Congo Basin up there, how they're, how they're ticking. Yeah? And so in effect, these rainforests are engines uh, that are keeping this global circulation, equatorial belt of, of, of moisture going. Right? And it's not one rainforest and it's not one continent, it's actually one integrated system. Uh, and the rain is actually falling not only in the equator, but actually as far as the US. Yeah? You see how it's irrigating all the crops in the US. It's uh, basically falling Australia, China, India, Russia, Europe, and so on. And so we start to see that actually this construct between, yeah, we're seeing that the equator is warming up and that uh, people in Africa are fighting more, is actually a very, very fragmented view of what really, really is going on. Um, and so those two things as, 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 as reminders for the rest of the day. One is the equator and the rest of the planet is much more interconnected than we think. And second, we depend on these natural infrastructures uh, to keep this system going, particularly around water, much, much uh, more importantly than we, that we think. And so let us zoom in again and look at one of these big, big parts of the system, yeah, the Amazon rainforest. What is happening with the Amazon rainforest? Yeah. And what we see is the ecological stress in the Amazon. Yes, climate change will have a massive impact, but deforestation is primarily drive it, dri driven by people and by economic fundamentals. And so this is, in, in red, uh, deforestation trends. This was done by people we work with in the Colombian Amazon. Um, in green, you see currently protected areas, whether it's indigenous um, safeguarded territories or national protected areas, and you, you will begin to see uh, how the pressures actually don't necessarily respect these boundaries. Yeah? So this is fires, industrial mining, uh, when Standard & Poor downgraded the risk of the United States a few months ago, what happened? You remember all in, in investors in financial markets uh, shifted towards gold, and that had a very, very immediate impact in the mining situation in Colombia, where the pressure amounted incredibly for formal, informal and black market uh, mining actually to getting into, into the space. And a lot of the, if you see the potential areas of mining in purple, actually perfectly overlapping with many of these uh, natural protected areas. And so this is really challenging the way we will think about conservation going forward. Oil and gas, again, you see actual oil and gas exploration and, and oil blocks, uh, Colombia and Ecuador, future uh, and potential. Yeah? See the roads, 
Every time we build a road in the rainforest, we build infrastructure that opens the way for uh, all sorts of other actors to come in and create pressure and deforestation in, in the area. Hydropower, one, over 160 dams being planned, some stage of planning in the Amazon. Huge impacts, squares in black, current constructed dams, uh, other uh, little purple dots uh, planned or under construction and then the area in orange is the area that is currently affected. And this is the overall set of pressures, right? So what we're doing in effect is slowly, or perhaps quite rapidly, uh, uh, eating into a system that is quite vital from a planetary perspective. And this is obviously happening in the Congo Basin. We have less information there. Uh, it's happening in Southeast Asia's forest and so on, right? Uh, Climate change is a game changer for this, but the fundamental pressures and ecological stress is driven by us. And so let's zoom out again, and we see that in essence we've been doing this uh, around the planet, and this is over the last 300 years. The, the land pressures that we drank primarily because, because of agriculture, because we need to eat, uh, is, is, is one of the main pressures. Factor in population growth, and you start to see that this is going, it's going to be very difficult to maintain these natural capital spaces. It's going to be very tough to maintain natural protected areas, uh, even though the role that they play in the resilience of our systems is quite vital. So we're entering very, very difficult trade-offs. And again, uh, soil degradation is perhaps one of the most important drivers of, uh, of, of, of uh, loss of, producti of productivity. Uh, and perhaps should be one of the most, if not the most important element when we think about climate security going forward. So you see what's happening with soil degradation. This was year 2000, by the way. Yeah? And so you see red areas very degraded. And in essence, this connects back to the projected food production losses that will be driven by climate change. And you see that the areas in red is up to 50% loss in, in, in food production loss. And you start to see that the strategic map of the world is, being, is going to change in completely unexpected ways that do not necessarily correlate to the way we look at the equator and uh, you know, greater uh, temperature and greater instability. Right? And this is one of the areas we're looking at at the moment and, and is basically that this is leading to a, a whole other set of pressures that have to do with investment and, and, and global markets and is essentially the global scramble for, uh, for, for farmland. Yeah? And it's the interest of nations to secure the supplies of food, to secure access to water, to irrigate the crops, uh, and to secure access to commodities. And this, is, this cannot be seen in isolation from uh, actually the climate and ecological stresses. And so many of you might have seen the letters published by Jeremy Grantham of, of uh, GMO in the US, uh, guru in the financial markets, and what he's saying is, from 2000 onwards, we're seeing a climb in the price of commodities, and this is not going to stop. Commodities are going to become more and more and more and more expensive. And this is primarily driven by uh, resource scarcity. Right? And so you start to see how climate change is a big, big steroid that's being injected in a system that is completely dysfunctional, but is dysfunctional primarily because of us. Right? Uh, and the way we think about ecological stress and the diminishing of these uh, natural systems is quite tied to the behavior of commodity markets because of uh, resource scarcity. Um, and basically, this is only going to get worse. It's obvious. Right? This trend, uh, many argue, is just going to go up. So let me um, just um, offer one slide with some bullet points. Um, the first is that climate security is primarily, regard, is, is pr primarily connected to resource availability and access. That's what is going to really drive our security agenda. Um, the second is that natural resources, whether it's the soil fertility, whether it's rainforest, as you've seen, the role that they play in actually producing rainwater uh, or freshwater resources, they increase the resilience that we have. They increase the margin of error. Yeah? To some extent, the available biodiversity uh, it increases the express the risk. Yeah? If there are more species, then there's more chances that these systems continue working. The, the bad news is that we're actually depleting this natural capital at a, an extraordinary rate. Right? And, and we're doing this through economic policy fundamentals, we're doing this through financial markets, we're doing this also through subsistence issues as well, of course. Um, uh, and, and therefore, what's very important for us to in, 
take into account is, the, is the actually the ecological stress is very much tied to economic uh, and to resource politics and governance. We saw in the case of the Jordan in the Middle East, uh, there's perhaps a 90% decrease in the water flow going through the Jordan, and actually it's very much a question of distribution, right? Who will get that water uh, going forward? And this is why uh, climate security policies face very, very difficult uh, challenges and, and dilemmas. Because in essence, the conflicts that are driven by climate security and the conflicts that are driven by these problems that have a very strong -ish character of access and availability of resources will have to determine actually who those resources are, are, are going to go to, right? Who will be uh, um, uh, entitled to continue exploiting, to continue irrigating a field and so on. Um, and if you think about what's going on in the Middle East at the moment, you can only think about how difficult that will be um, when, when we have to put these issues of, of equity and distribution onto this agenda. This is why some people are very excited that the UN Security Council is taking on the issue of climate change, but other people that are more familiar with how uh, international security policy works say um, it's not going to be so simple. We don't want the UN Security Council to come in and say who's going to keep the water in the Jordan River going forward. It's actually very difficult to do. And these are some of the, I think, choices and dilemmas that we will face as we move into the uh, realm of security policy and try to deal with these issues that are not just atmospheric physics. It's that plus uh, the questions of, of availability and access of, of nature. Um, let me just stop there so we can move on quickly. Thanks very much. Alejandro Litovsky from the uh, Earth Security uh, Initiative. Thank you very much indeed f for that. And uh, just perhaps to emphasize what he said, uh, a couple of years ago I was with David Miliband, the then Foreign Secretary, visiting Jordan, and he had to then go on to Israel, and he came back uh, to the back of the bus and said, I've decided I'm going to walk over the Al-Nabi Bridge into uh, Israel. This will be a dramatic moment. No Foreign Secretary has ever walked across the bridge since whatever, 1945 or whatever. And uh, we all got out of the bus and Trapes got our cameras and the rest, it's a huge bridge over the Jordan. And it was quite clear the rather exuberant David Miliband was expecting quite some spread of water. And we got to the parapet and craned over and we were all trying to see amongst the reed bed any sign whatever of the river. And in the end, it was possible when we clambered down to see a three foot wide stream it's no more than that, absolutely incredible. And uh, uh, he was visibly shaken by what we'd actually seen. And we had seen something graphically illustrating precisely what you have so marvelously presented in your um, slides there. Thank you very much. Our next speaker uh, is Paul Pierce Kelly. He's senior creator at the Zoological Society in London. And perhaps more importantly, he's been there for 30 years, 30 years in which his world must quite literally have turned upside down. Yes. Right. Thank you, John. Uh, right. Uh, I should say this is in presentation with my colleague, uh, Sandra Keir, who uh, is uh, with us as well. Uh, I've subtitled it, uh, The Need for a Paradigm Shift in Thinking. And Ali Jandro mentioned the paradigm shift in his own presentation. And I think that should be something of a theme as we go through today. These are profoundly changing uh, dynamics now when you bring climate change into almost any consideration. Being in a medical gathering, I thought it might be relevant to throw up a very well-known uh, image, nine, uh, 1828, I think it was, when a hitherto unseen menace was made known to the populace uh, um, and generated a great demand that something must be done. And of course, that led subsequently to Basil Jet's Herculean work on the water systems and everything else. Never underestimate the power of a good cartoon. But it's interesting, here we are now. Two fundamental concerns really want to pick up. Are we sufficiently aware of the global warming threat and are we sufficiently responding to that threat? And against the context of which we're asked to provide for colleagues here is what's in store for biodiversity, but very much and us. What's in store? We hear a lot. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm going to make that very clear. It's all too obvious uh, that our colleagues here who are, thank goodness, uh, I've been involved in uh, the climate um, change impact considerations for the last six years plus. And I'm from the conservation community, the environmental community, and we started off very much thinking 
for my community anyway, it's a rolled up sleeves issue. We must jolly well incorporate climate change impacts into our conservation planning, our, our actual management tools and approaches. But the more you became aware of the sheer uh, dynamics that climate change presents, the change in the whole way of um, how you can go forward, it's much more fundamental than that. And all the time, just as we've been catching up with those realities, we've been finding that the time frames for response are getting shorter and shorter and shorter, and the sensitivities seem to be that much greater and greater. So one of our first efforts was to pull a lot of information together to understand the subject, and anyone has that challenge, be they a zoologist, uh, a father, a mother, uh, um, a politician, anyone. We all need to have that basic knowledge so we can understand the subject. Uh, the metrics of uh, metrics for dangerous climate change, how do we understand what we consider to be dangerous? Um, we've heard in the uh, last summary some very good um, highlights there, but again, I'm picking up from uh, Jim Hansen's summation of that, the extermination of animal and plant species, ice sheet disintegration, global sea level, regional climate disruptions extreme weather events, shifting climate zones, fresh water shortages, as we've heard just a while ago. Metrics, and I would add to that, socioeconomic impacts. I, I don't feel we hear enough about that in terms of the, 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 the actual uh, danger that, that presents and the actual threat. As big effects and consequences begin to become apparent, I don't think it's going to be easier to address them. It's going to be harder because the pressure on social systems are going to be that much greater, and the cost for inaction is going to go up and up and up. Uh, and that leads you to, okay, where are the sensitivities? And again, Chris may be able to speak far more eloquently than I, but again, we've come to an understanding from going through the sciences. We best under, understand it that we are looking at very fine sensitivities, considerably lower than what the uh, general consensus political targets are currently. Much, much more sensitive for key considerations. And these aren't the... Um, announcements of way end of spectrum people. These are coming into increasing uh, realization within the literature. Very significant, um, very significant uh, heavy, heavyweight specialists. Uh, you can't see those names, but you know, really significant people coming to actually make those same urgent um, uh, statements. And again, I put Tim Lenton's uh, recent article in there as well, he makes the point, it's not just a global temperature issue, it's the regional effects are very significant as well and themselves can be uh, uh, catastrophic. Uh, we were engaged a couple of years ago in a very, uh, there's a voluminous and arcane literature on corals, as you probably know, and uh, you probably heard about coral stress through climate change, thermal stress, and ocean acidification. Uh, we had a meeting with colleagues at the Royal Society because in, despite the uh, voluminous literature, there's very little about actual tipping points and um, critical thresholds. So the idea was that we focused on that work through the science with leading specialists in both the coral reef community and in the climate community and came to, again, very much a, a clear feeling that we are at those finer sensitivities. We must get down to below 350 parts per million CO2 if we are to have a viable future for coral reefs and all that that entails if they go down. Uh, Real-world observations in the meantime, uh, again in the literature, worrying uh, articles presenting of methane venting on the Siberian. I don't want to go into this too much, I'm sure that Chris will pick up on it. Real-world observations, again, is it climate change related or is it not? Is there other stresses? We know there are many stresses at play, but when you start to see like significant percentage declines in phytoplankton populations, it's time to get rather worried because these are basal, basal um, uh, elements in the systems. Uh, we, health again, mosquito range spread and uh, behavioral change. Uh, we have quite a lot of focus on, on the actual mosquitoes because we, uh, again, it's one of our areas for animal health, but also it's a profound issue for human health as well. And the mosquitoes and such pest species are on the move, uh, invasive alien species, etc. Uh, very significant uh, impacts. Not least it's been going on because we've been moving things around and uh, causing a lot of this, but climate change will drive that process and uh, let things which will just turn up in London suddenly be able to persist in London or in uh, Geneva or wherever it may be. Species range, examples there, the Asian tiger, mosquito, 
and uh, another species which is causing a lot of problem over in Germany. And the diseases are catching up with these species. They're not sitting there in splendid isolation. The diseases are catching up as well. So these are really practical issues. There's currently looking at just a quick allusion to the zoo community. A wide global community is involved in a surveillance initiative tracking those mosquito populations on their sites in uh, partnership with wildlife parks to try and see these the kind of recording of these movements. And so how do we know that, uh, climate change may impact species? There's increasing sophistication knowledge. We are not so worried about that now. We, it's a combination of the susceptibility, the exposure, and you can work out the, ex the extinction risk. You don't have to worry about seeing the detail of that, but very sophisticated ways of working out the actual predicted change against the likely effects on species X uh, you're actually looking at. And that's a real credit to organizations like the IUCN and uh, uh, Imperial College and our, uh, colleagues at ZSL and many other areas against what the predictions are, but that's the key consideration. So one of the examples there is shifting climate zone uh, 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 ranges, shifting, um, shifting climate zones, a very significant consideration when you're trying to uh, manage the species conservation needs or the Kenyan coffee crop or whatever else it might be. Uh, and these things, these zones are moving much faster than species in terms of observations are able to keep up with, and that is set to become much more significant as we go into the future. So these present very high um, risks, uh, both at species level and also at landscape level. So species are facing a raft of pressures there, a whole raft, uh, I won't go through it, but the end point is how can policy best respond? If you look at something like the global amphibian crisis, colleagues may have heard about that. There's some 6,000 amphibians in the world. They're under terrible pressures uh, from introduced predators, habitat loss, fragmentation, pollution, uh, dreadful diseases which are going around. But again, climate change is increasingly presenting as a driver for that and creating a whole new range of um, additional problems. And the IUCN back in 2008 did a very wide ranging review against the then known picture for amphibians. And they found when they put them through the uh, same process that you've just seen, they had a m many more species coming out as threatened, okay? Not all, but a very significant percentage, predicted 15 to 37% predicted to go extinct. So again, though, a very important point to make to colleagues here, that they were doing that uh, evaluation against the mid-range scenario, the um, middle one. And that's what we all tend to do. Uh, we've been going through a similar process at the ZSL. We looked at migratory species under the Appendix 1 uh, convention, a very wide range of species, going through the same uh, methodologies, you can have a very elaborate scoring system, and it ends up with you have a tranche of species, look at them, turtles, whales, all kinds of things, snow, snow leopards, highly vulnerable to climate change, and a raft of species as having a medium vulnerability to climate change. Now, if we're looking at those earlier sensitivities, how can we square that? That's because we are also reliant on what's published, the previous standardization approach, we follow the mid-range scenario, so we're at risk. I'm just urging here that we are creating a relatively, um, we're drifting from the reality, and that's a danger that we need to keep in mind very much, because we are tracking those higher range scenarios. So again, that's not a true reflection. And the more recent study of a subgroup, just going through those amphibia again, when you look at what we heard, the summary of what's happening on the Amazon, and you look through some of the recent work there and you tie those currently least threatened species. No one's, no one's actually worried about those species. They have huge range. They're under no threats. If you look at what's on the papers, when you go through and you layer those threats, they are, it's a false picture. They are, they are a much greater threat and indeed they migrate into a state what you might call to be a non-viable status from the perspective of likely future viable habitat. So there's a growing conservation challenge. We need to have incorporated realistic climate change impact considerations in our threat evaluation and our, and our decision making, no matter what it is. If it's socioeconomic, water management, conflict, whatever it is, same thing, health kind of management. And we will be increasingly presented with non-viable species and indeed habitats uh, and even larger uh, levels which we have to be addressed. So we're going to have to make very hard choices. The conservation community has always said, no matter with the last four, that's the big focus, we'll put all the resources in, whatever happens, we know we can eventually get the habitat 
habitat sorted one day, climate change changes all that. Even the very notion of protected areas, the Serengeti, all of these well-known places, climate shift dynamics is working there, not protected, and we have to plan new thinking and ways to cope with those and assisted colonization, etc. So what are we going to do with all of those non-viable species which they're increasingly going to present? We have to find more ways of lower biosecurity management and ways through in some way. So we need to be ensuring that we are uh, planning, it's informed, it's robust, and above all, it's flexible. Because again, these shifting climate zones alone create unbelievably comp complicated problems, but we must work on the reality of the paths we're actually on, not what the previous studies showed. And again, those metrics for climate change, those sensitivities, and I'm seeing some recent papers coming out really asking the question and very worrying, is it too late to actually still make it? Can we get back to these safe levels? And this is the really profound worry. And to pick up John's and as a criticality of natural systems come into play there, as we've heard, 17 to 20 percent of emissions come from destruction of natural habitats, but, um, particularly in terms of the um, forest uh, loss. Uh, if you bring in all of the other elements, the wetlands, grasslands, etc., these are areas that could be addressed relatively straightforward to the great benefit of all concerned, and yet it's not being realized. It's a crazy situation. But what's our view on agriculture? What's our view on viable energy options? Is there a compelling case for nuclear power? What's our view on geoengineering? You can't just say, well, I'm an animal specialist and I only know about snail management and forest systems. I need to know about those things and have an informed view as a parent, as a species program manager. That's the kind of stuff I need to know. So again, uh, one thing, John, if you just would give me two minutes to show colleagues what I think might speak to something we might pick up later. Why are we failing? Why is everything going completely the wrong way? We've done a quick initial analysis of currently available climate change position statements. And what we found is that uh, we went through intergovernmental and governmental, we went through the academic and the, sci and the scientific, the environmental community and the socio-economic community. And just to very quickly show you just a very, very glimpse of that, we went through the impacts, mitigation, adaptation and policy, who was actually talking about target thresholds and actual numbers, who was bringing up risk and uncertainty, and did they include references? Very mixed picture. Even in the academic and the scientific, look at ocean acidification. Tiny, tiny amount of people actually talking about that relative to 104, the international and the national scientific academies, the leading university, the research groups. Very, you know, it's, it's, it's a real mixed picture. And sometimes the critical areas get very sl slant attention. And maybe that speaks to why we're in the situation we are. And it presents as well when you're talking through uh, the actual government's um, situations. It's a very similar situation. I haven't ringed it, but it's, a, it's, it's a similar. Lots of key issues not being picked up. So is it surprising that people just aren't aware of them? Socio-economic, um, it's a relatively simple picture. We haven't done the environmental clear enough to show you, but I'll make this available to colleagues because I think this goes to the heart of the matter, whether you're trying to save uh, species X or population Y or local, you know, community or country viability or the whole region. You know, these, why, I think this speaks a lot to the situation we're actually in. We are in a really bizarre place. So I think summarizing, uh, there's lots of possible reasons why, why there is. A lot of people think it's not my job. A lot of people, we don't, we just give policy relevant information, but we don't talk about policy, it's not our place. Or we don't realize the, the actual, everything we, we are involved in has um, importance to input into the bigger system, or we just have too narrow a focus, and often we have a vested interest. We just pursue our vested interests. We are just concerned about forest uh, rehabilitation or, or a particular type of energy policy or whatever it is. And more often, we're assuming it's been done by others. And we're seeing here it's not. So we, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fatal decision to make, absolutely fatal. So we need to get those improved. We need to be responding to the critical areas within these statements or our views and how we're informing colleagues and people and policy makers, that's an example of a position statement by the Zoological Society of London, which tried to do something uh, proper along those lines and brought in one of our fellow primates to help to communicate that to the wider uh, community. 
And again, ocean acidification, even the environmental community, hardly mentioning a critical area that could take the whole system down on its own. So it just shows how you know, bad the situation is. And if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. So there we are. Thank you very much. Paul Pierce Kelly, Kelly, thank you very much indeed. And maybe if you can give us the links or whatever, we can feed them into the system in the course of the day, and then people can go back to those figures. Thank you very much indeed. Well, our next and f uh, final speaker of this round before we go into questions is Chris Rapley, Professor of Climate Science at uh, University College London. Um, an amazing um, CV of uh, Director of Science Museum, uh, Director of the British Antarctic Survey in the past, and I think still President of the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research. Um, so he's been there. Thank you, John. Good morning, everybody. Um, we, we've heard this morning both the Secretary of State and Lord Jay say that the science of climate change is overwhelming. Um, I don't think I heard the word settled, and I'd argue with that. No science is ever completely settled. Uh, but it's certainly true that of, of any scientific issue, uh, of the tens of thousands of scientists around the world, in, in many nations, at least 80, 90 nations, have active uh, scientists working in this field, um, there is almost complete agreement that um, the, the, the climate is changing and so on. Uh, which is odd when you think what a, a belligerent, argumentative lot uh, the science community are, uh, and also that they make a living out of proving each other wrong. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an interesting point. Um, but what we also know is that, um, particularly from uh, studies that have, have uh, looked at uh, views and, uh, and understanding in the general public, the sort of thing that the Science Museum uh, carried out uh, a year or so ago as a prelude to uh, designing and, and delivering its atmosphere gallery, which is about climate science, um, is that by, by and large, um, the, the general public, people who are not experts in this field, know that climate change is important. They're very embarrassed then to reveal what they actually know about the subject. And, and when one does persuade them in the end to peel away the layers and reveal what they know, it's pretty hazy um, and generally the dots aren't linked together. That doesn't stop them having strong beliefs and, and, and you'll know that many people have strong beliefs one way or the other. So I thought it would be worthwhile just at the end of this session this morning going briefly over the framework uh, upon which uh, all of this discussion relies. And so I've set myself five questions to answer. Has climate changed before? Are the current circumstances unusual? Is the planet warming? How do we know? Uh, is it us? How do we know? And does it matter? So I'll just go through those five questions quickly. So has the climate changed before? And the answer, of course, is yes, uh, on many timescales for many reasons. Not least because the, the sun, which is the primary, primary energy source driving the motions of the fluids on the planet, so the ocean, the atmosphere, driving the photosynthesis upon which all of the food chain, all of biology depends, uh, varies. It, it's increased in its luminosity by about 30% over the four and a half billion year age of the planet and its output fluctuates. So yes, the, the sun changes and it drives changes in the Earth's climate system. Also, the growth of the biosphere itself has completely changed the um, uh, chemistry of the atmosphere. Before life came along, um, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. So Jim, Jim Lovelock pointed out some years ago that by, in his sort of Gaia theory that the biology isn't a passenger. It's an active, interconnected part of the system, and it drives change, which has its impacts on the climate system. Even the shifting of the continents, the slow shifting of the continents, changes the way heat is absorbed and reflected from the surface of the planet, and that alters the, the climate system. And we know that um, uh, of, of recent uh, geological history, millions of years, subtle changes in the tilt and precession and shape of the Earth's orbit drive either 40,000 year or 100,000 year cycles of ice ages and interglacials. So there's plenty of evidence um, that the system uh, is not only driven by change, but it also, because it's a highly interconnected, complex system, it has internal variability. Now, those that um, would deny that climate change is a problem often point to this, um, and of course, uh, as if that made everything all right. But actually, what this tells us is that the climate system is quite a frisky beast. It, responded, it responds to relatively subtle driving forces and can change quite dramatically.
Indeed, it's, it's rather funny that there's been a lot of argument about the hockey stick. You know, was the medieval warming greater than the present warming? Well, those that argue that it was, given that the, the causes behind it were extremely subtle, are arguing for a very high climate sensitivity, which is not in their interest if they pursue the logic of their arguments. So, uh, has the climate changed before? Yes. Um, is the current situation unusual? Yes. Um, later this month, the uh, population will exceed 7 billion people, um, we're told. Um, and we know that human impacts on the planet scale with population consumption uh, and, and then can be mediated or, or, or reduced by the efficiency with which we uh, use resources and energy. Um, the Anthropocene, uh, so-called uh, uh, by um, uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, because the uh, in future generations looking back will see the evidence of humans as the dominant influence on the planet uh, at this stage in its geological history, uh, is a no analog state. There's never been anything like it before. Our impact on the land surface, we, we've changed the land surface, more than 50% of it. Uh, species loss, habitat, the nitrogen cycle with our use of uh, fertilizers and so on is dramatic. Um, but of course, from the point of view of climate change, uh, the biggest impact that we've had is to burn half a trillion tons of carbon and use that literally to power the wealth and prosperity of the modern world, which we all enjoy. And unwittingly, by releasing that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we have increased the quantity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the concentration, by the same amount as the Earth naturally alters the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere on recently a 100,000 year time scale between a glacial and an interglacial. So the same amount, but in 100 years, which is over 100 times faster than anything that you can find uh, in the geological ice core record. Now, not very far from here, there's the Royal Institution, and, and John Tyndall uh, in the uh, mid-19th century was amazed to discover um, he was interested in how heat was transferred through the atmosphere. And he was amazed to discover that the nitrogen and the oxygen of which uh, constitute the bulk of the atmosphere are transparent to heat, and that it's these tiny little trace gases, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and others, that are the active ingredients that prevent heat uh, just radiating its way straight out to space. And it's a jolly good job they do, because if they didn't, the surface of the Earth would be 30 degrees cooler than it currently is. So its average temperature would be minus 15 degrees, it would be frozen over, and we wouldn't be having this discussion. So the physics of the greenhouse effect has been pretty well understood for uh, well over 100 years. And indeed, the Swedish atmospheric chemist, Van Arrhenius, at the end of the 19th century, spent two years doing hand calculations to figure out what the amount of warming would be if one doubled the amount of carbon di dioxide, and he came up with a figure of four degrees centigrade, which is not very far from what the modern uh, uh, models and calculations come up with too. Interestingly, he thought it would be a good thing uh, because it would increase agricultural productivity, but he also thought it would take mankind a thousand years to do it. He had no concept of how quickly we would dig up uh, coal, oil, and gas and burn it. So is the current situation unusual? Yes, it is. Is the planet warming? Well, uh, if you want to answer that question, there are two places that you would uh, specifically go and look. Uh, the ocean carries 70% of the planet's surface, and it's darker than the land. And if you do the calculation, you expect that about 90% of the heat imbalance due to the enhanced greenhouse effect should be disappearing into the ocean. Now, there's a major campaign, multi-international campaign, tossing thousands, uh, three and a half thousand uh, buoys, or if you're American, buoys, uh, into the ocean, which make lots of measurements. Uh, but again, Jim Lovelock uh, uses one single graph, and that is the graph of sea level, sea level over the last 100 years. Now, up until about 20 years ago, that was measured by uh, a large number of tide gauges, generally coastal, uh, around the world. And it's quite a difficult task to correct those for all sorts of pressure and ocean dynamic effects and assemble them together into a single measure of sea level uh, averaged over the surface of the planet, but th that's possible to do. Um, but over the last 20 years or so, it's been made um, more effective, if not easier, um, because there are satellites orbiting the planet continuously uh, that are firing radar pulses from themselves down to the ocean surface, and every 10 days they uh, come up with a figure for the average height of the ocean relative to the Earth's center of gravity. 
And from those data sets, we know that over the last century, uh, that is the 20th century, sea level was rising at about 1.82 millimeters a year. Prior to that, for at least 2,000 years, maybe longer, it had been stable. Uh, it, it had stabilized at the end of the last ice age. So that 1.8 millimeters per year didn't sound very much, but uh, it was significant. But what we find now that it's running at about 3.5, 3.8 millimeters a year. Um, so over a century, by the end of the century, uh, 35 centimeters, which again doesn't sound very much on the average, but it has a big impact on the likelihood of extreme ev events overwhelming sea defenses, and, and particularly London is of concern in, in that respect. So the first place you look is the, is the ocean. Um, is the ocean rising? Yes, it is. Sea level is rising. Why would it do that? Well, it would do it for two reasons. Firstly, because the ocean is getting warmer, and that's where the 90% of the heat is going, and we can check that with those buoys, and uh, that looks to be uh, all consistent. And of course, if you warm a liquid, it, it expands. And, and the ocean being, on average, three and a half kilometers deep, you don't have to warm it very much to see a significant rise. Um, Jim, again, says, uh, you know, the traditional way of measuring temperatures was to put a liquid, either alcohol or mercury, in a glass bulb with a tube, braided uh, tube, and you would warm it up and the liquid would expand. In the case of the Earth, gravity is very conveniently holding the liquid on, and we can see it expand by looking at these satellite or, or tide gauge data. So is the planet warming? Yes, it is partly because of the thermal expansion, but also because of the other part of the Earth that one would go and look at, that is the cryosphere, the place where the uh, water is frozen. The cryosphere is showing accelerating melting, and some of that water is going into the ocean and raising sea level. Now, uh, if we look at the uh, Greenland or Antarctic ice sheet, we see signs of growth in some places, and that's because a warmer atmosphere carries more moisture, hence more snow, dumps more snow on the very high, cold plateau. But around the edges, and if you think of it, the edge marks where on average the temperature is about 0 degrees, um, we see in many places very substantial accelerating loss of ice, and, and that is indeed contributing to this sea level rise. And in particular, in the Arctic Basin, uh, which is an ocean covered with a thin layer of frozen ocean, we see in the summer when it melts back a very, very dramatic uh, increase in the amount of melting that's been going on over the last 30 years. The area has been reducing at about 7% per year. This year, almost but not quite broke the record of 2007. Um, with huge impacts in terms of the connection between the ocean and the atmosphere in the Arctic. It will completely change the dynamics of that coupling, completely change the dynamics of the biology in that area. It will change the geopolitical situation there, which is something, of course, that this conference is very interested in. So is the planet warming? Yes, it is. Um, is it us? Because uh, it could be warming for all sorts of reasons, as, I, as I've said. Well, if it's warming because of the enhanced greenhouse effect, we would expect to see more infrared radiation coming back at the surface from the atmosphere. We would expect to see less infrared radiation making its way out into space. And both of those things are found to be true from measurements made on the ground and by satellites. Very difficult measurements, lots of noise, very noisy signal, but the evidence is emerging that that is true. We would also expect to see the warming that's occurred over the last 40 or 50 years being stronger at night uh, than in the daytime, uh, and in winter, than in the summertime. And again, the data support that. Um, but for me, a clinching um, uh, piece of evidence is that if it were the sun that had uh, warmed up, we, we make measurements of the sun, we, we know it hasn't, but if it were that, and some people argue that that may be the case, you would expect the whole atmosphere to warm up. If it's greenhouse gases that are reducing the amount of heat making its way through the atmosphere to space, you would expect the lower and middle part of the atmosphere to warm, you would expect the stratosphere to cool. And indeed, we see stratospheric cooling. So is it us? The fingerprint, the pattern, says yes. Of, of course, it's always possible to find some temperature record somewhere, Punta Arenas between 1937 and 1940, that goes the other way, or some glacier somewhere that goes the other way. Um, but that's because it's a hugely complex system with lots of processes going on within it. You need to look at the pattern. Now, does it matter? Um, we've heard from the previous speakers, uh, Alejandro in particular, um, that the climate system is, is interconnected. Think of it as a heat engine. More heat comes in at the equator than it does at the poles. 
and it's the, uh, it's the fluids that transport that heat from the warmer areas to the colder areas, and in doing so, carry moisture, winds, um, dust as well for that matter, around the planet, and distribute water vapor in patterns that we inherited, uh, a civilization inherited, and which we have adopted for our water supplies, our food supplies, our transport systems, and so on. And remember, it's the government here itself that blamed the uh, snow and uh, unusual cold spell just before last Christmas. We had a couple of those recently on uh, a, a minus 0.5% uh, drop in GDP. So these things matter, not just to the poor people of the world, they matter to us, they matter to everybody in civilized nations. But what we're really concerned about is um, not only are we already not perfectly adapted to the climate system that we inherited, because changing conditions in the Pacific will, within El Nino teleconnect to the grain belts in South America, uh, in Africa, and, and you can see when, that when there's a strong El Nino, you can have up to a, a loss of 50% of grain harvest in those areas. Um, but the climatic zones themselves um, are known to shift. And I'll give a couple of examples. Well, actually, I'll give three examples. I'll give an extra one, because anybody who read Metro this morning, so it must be true, um, will have seen that nice little piece showing that uh, after the last ice age, for quite a while, uh, there was more than a land bridge. There was a fertile area uh, of countryside between the UK um, and Europe, uh, which was well inhabited by human beings, and which, of course, was lost as sea level rise uh, continued its rise and finished off. I, I mean, I know the Tory right are probably pretty pleased about that, but uh, it's had a big impact on those that were inhabiting the area at the time. Um, but ab about 5,000 years ago, um, uh, the area of the Sahara, which is now just a, a, a featureless desert which supports uh, very few people uh, leading a very hard lifestyle, was a very plush um, uh, area with a, a huge east-west river system that ran across it with hippopotami and vegetation, a uh, very fertile area. Um, and we know this because some of these radars on the satellites can image through the desert sand, up to 10 meters of sand, and they can see uh, this dendritic system of now dried up and choked uh, river channels beneath. So a major change, a massive change, a shift uh, in the climate patterns had a huge impact on that area, mediated through water. And, and you hear a lot about you know, the temperatures warming and what effect that warming will have, but actually Nick Stern in his report noted that the main intersection between climate change and humans is mediated through water, either the extreme lack of it through extensive drought or the extreme excess of it through massive inundations and floods. And, and we are beginning to see patterns of extreme flooding and extreme drought which are suggestive of uh, climatic change taking place now. There's not a climatologist that would put their hand on their heart and say that that's yet statistically significant, but look at the patterns that we've been observing over the last few years of the 100-year event, the extreme event. Uh, the statistics are beginning to emerge. The, um, the other example I'd give is of the Aral Sea, where human intervention in the case of uh, the Soviet Union irrigating its cotton fields diverted rivers that caused what was the fourth uh, largest lake in the world to essentially dry up. It's now about 10% of its previous area, with huge impacts, as you can imagine, on the fishing industry in the area, but also on the uh, climate and uh, agricultural productivity around it. So I'll finish by just pointing out that if we don't do something, uh, at the rate we're going, it, it, in spite of all of the efforts that so many of us have made uh, over the last um, decades, so the UNFCC, right down to individuals changing their carbon habits, carbon emissions continue to accelerate. And if we don't do something, if we don't turn that over, then it's not 450 parts per million or 650 parts per million we could be at at the end of the century. It could be 1,000 parts per million. Now, that would be 10 times the change uh, between the last ice age and the current interglacial. And you've got to be a pretty optimistic individual to believe that that would be okay, that somehow that would be fine. It, 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 all of the evidence is that that would not be fine. So if we just look at my five questions, has climate changed before? Yes. Are the current circumstances unusual? Yes. Is the planet warming? Yes. Is it us? Yes. Does it matter? Yes. Should we do something about it? Yes. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Chris Rapley. We're going to move quickly to questions, um, if we could be um, reasonably succinct. And I've got a first questioner, Adrian Lister. Adrian, if you'd like to start the questioning. Yeah. 